Hello, I'm Dr. Helen Chersky, and this is part of the Humanism at Home series. It's an attempt to bring humanism to people who are at home during this pan pandemic and who are looking to use that time to learn something new. This is an essay that I originally wrote quite a, perhaps five or six years ago now, and it was for Ada Lovelace Day. And if you don't know about Ada Lovelace Day, it's the second Tuesday of October every year. So it'll be on the 13th of October this year, 2020. And there are lots of events on that day celebrating women in science. And this essay was written for an anthology about women in science that's called A Passion for Science, Tales of Discovery and Invention. And that is available as an ebook from Amazon. But this is my essay, Sewing the Future. There seems to be a very annoying perception in society that women don't do technology. If you see a picture of an app designer, a welder, an aircraft engineer or a rocket scientist, you're probably also looking at someone who owns a Y chromosome. That's really irritating, but I think it's only half the problem. I think that women traditionally do do technology and lots of it. The problem is that we don't think of act women's activities in this way, even when that's exactly what they are. Here's how the Merriam-Webster dictionary defines technology. 1a. The practical application of knowledge, especially in a particular area. 1b. The, technology, the capability given by the practical application of knowledge. 2. A manner of accomplishing a task, especially using technical processes, methods or knowledge. And 3. The specialised aspects of a particular field of endeavour. Just reading those words makes me excited. I love making things and a lot of the fun is in working out how to use the tools available to get something practical done. Men don't have a monopoly on this, either in current society or historically. Technology is done by people, not specifically men or women, just people. So let me tell you about Babcha's sewing machine. Babcha is the Polish word for grandmother. I remember seeing the sewing machine in her flat when she was still alive and it fascinated me because it was both alien and familiar at the same time. It was a Singer treadle powered machine built into a small wooden table with decorative wooden legs. The table was fantastic, I loved it because it just looked like any other table until you lifted the flap in the centre and then the black iron sewing machine rotated into place from where it had been hiding underneath. Once you had connected up the belt, the way it worked and the way it looked were really similar to the modern electric sewing machine that my mum had taught me to use, as long as you kept your foot moving on the treadle. I loved it because it was mechanical and you could see how it worked. I have it now and I like it for the same reasons that I like massive steam engines. It's ingenious. And I know how to sew and I like making things out of fabric. That's ingenious too. It never occurred to me as a child that most of society put loving the mechanics and loving the sewing in different categories. It never occurred to me as a child that most of society put loving the mechanics and loving the sewing machine in different categories. I just saw it all as part of one continuous process. And when Babcha was alive, I had no idea of the part that her sewing machine had played in family life. The machine opened the door to technological solutions to everyday problems. And the person that worked out the way to solve those problems, to use the available technology to make life better, was Babcia. My dad Jan was born in Poland in 1941. Jadek, my grandfather, had been conscripted to fight for the German army, forced into it along with many other Poles from the region of Silesia. This meant that the family was split up during the war. Like so many other Polish families at that time, they were just flotsam on the massive currents of international war. But they were lucky. Jadik escaped from the German army. The family reunited in Italy and they travelled to Britain. And Jadik then fought for the British. In 1947, after much debate, the British government under Winston Churchill decided to permanently take in nearly a quarter of a million Polish war refugees. They were housed in recently vacated army camps and given some money for schools and a basic camp structure. These Polish resettlement camps, Polish camps, were spread all over Britain and many of them only closed in the 1960s or even later. The camp structure was basic. The Poles lived in Nissan huts, shared between families at first. 
There might be agricultural work in the local community, but after that, it was up to the newer immigrants to scrape a living however they could. Babcha and Jadek had been teachers in Poland, a highly respected profession. Now they had a stable home, but no stable income, and they had to start, start from scratch in a foreign country. I've always been impressed at how much effort the Poles put in to build their community. They set up a school, they had church and community events, and they worked hard. But life was tough. My dad remembers that there were two major purchases, almost impossible to afford, but considered essential practical tools. There was a typewriter for Jadek and a sewing machine for Babcha. When we envisage past civilizations, the mental image always has something in plain sight that we rarely consider consciously. Clothes. Humans are physically frail compared with other mammals and need the extra protection that clothes provide. We use our brains and manual dexterity to compensate for our physiological weaknesses. And it seems that as long as there have been clothes, those clothes have been an outward representation of the person within and their place in society. Emperors wore purple. School children wear school uniforms. Papua New Guinea warriors wear feathers from birds of paradise. These are badges of society, part of the glue that binds communities together. Just think about all of those clothes. They all came from somewhere. A person had to make them. For most of modern history, everything has been sewed by hand. Sewing machines were invented in the early 1800s, but they weren't universally popular. In 1841, one of the first factories using sewing machines to make French army uniforms was destroyed by tailors worried about losing their jobs. Clothes have mostly been made by women, and the invention of the sewing machine sped up this essential household task significantly. Next time you're doing your laundry or tidying your coat rack, have a proper look at how your clothes are made. There is no question that this is technology in action. The cloth must be cut in the right orientation relative to its threads, so it hangs and stretches correctly. Two-dimensional pieces of cloth must be fitted together to make an object that fits a three-dimensional moving person. Fabric can be joined together with different stitches that do different jobs. And then all of that construction work is hidden away, so it's never the first thing you notice. My mum taught me to sew, and there are also a few classes at school. My problem with it was that I never quite had the patience for all the details. I like making snazzy cushion covers and theatre props, but when it came to the time-consuming details of how to sew a collar so it sat flat, I was usually to be found on the hockey pitch or climbing a tree. But I loved making stuff that I could use, mats and bags and a waistcoat. As a technology, it can be pretty similar to Airfix kits for making model planes. Someone else has made a pattern, but you have to get all the construction details right and do it all in the right order. Making something without a pattern is a bit like a bit making something without a pattern is a bit more like building a model working aeroplane from whatever you've got lying around in the garage. You need both the creativity and the technical skill to use the tools available to do the job. Babcha did not know how to sew. Someone of her social status in Poland would not have had to learn. My dad says that she was not enthusiastic about the new challenge, but it was understood in the camp that sewing was an essential skill. If you could do it, you could earn money. You could make clothes for your family. And that meant that you had some economic independence. Many other women were in the same situation and sewing classes were organised in the camp to teach the women this skill. Babcha had an advantage. They were the only family in the camp to have made the huge economic sacrifices necessary to buy a sewing machine. And almost immediately, there was a test. The Poles valued education above all else. My dad was one of the first to go to an English-speaking school, and he was nine or ten when the sewing machine was acquired. Dad passed the 11 plus and was given a place at the local grammar school. Babcha and Jadek were very proud, although they would have expected nothing less. But there was a requirement. For Dad to go to the grammar school, he had to have a blazer and trousers. There was no money to buy such expensive items, so Babcha would have to make them. 
The funny thing about our society, putting labels like male or female next to certain technological activities, is that those labels are purely cultural. If you were to list the skills needed to do any particular task, it's unlikely you'd be able to distinguish them. For a TV programme about the sun that I presented in early 2013, I had to talk to the camera while arc welding, so I had to learn how to arc weld. We filmed it in America and I was taught by an old school professional welder who had a slow southern drawl and a proper handlebar moustache. He was astonished that I learned so quickly, and even more astonished when I explained that this was because it was almost exactly like icing a cake. I'm certain that anyone who's ever done both would agree with me. So it turns out that I was mostly taught to arc weld by my mum when I was five years old and I practised with wobbly letters on a fairy cake. The pose you adopt is the same. Your left hand is closer to the nozzle, right elbow high up in the air, and the method of controlling the speed of either icing or welding metal is the same. You squeeze a lever. One might involve slightly more molten metal at 3000 degrees centigrade and slightly less sugar, but they're essentially indistinguishable. So don't tell me that women don't do technology. Babcha had to solve a three-dimensional construction puzzle with limited tools and almost no spare material to practice on. Remember that definition of technology? A manner of accomplishing a task, especially using technical processes, methods or knowledge. Sewing is a highly specialised task involving spatial reasoning, manual dexterity and attention to detail. This is technology. After a very stressful learning curve, Babcha succeeded. She was thrilled that the uniform was accepted by the school and that acceptance was seen as a major accolade. My dad was one of the first Polish children from the camp to go to the local grammar school and he could go dressed as the other boys were. His blazer was a different colour to the others because cloth was expensive and they couldn't afford the right colour and it makes him easy to identify on the school photograph. But he was set on the path to a good education. After that, the sewing machine had a central place in their hut. Once Babja had run the gauntlet of the blazer test, she did dressmaking and taught other women to sew. My dad and his sister were also taught to use the machine. And Babja was still sewing on that sewing machine when I first saw it 30 years later. She died when I was seven, so I never got to ask her about it. But even as a young child, it was clear to me that this technology was an important part of Babja's life. The cultural gender split of technologies is most interesting when the rules, so-called, are stretched. Did anyone else notice that once the age of the male celebrity chef came along, kitchen mixers and blenders suddenly started to be made of brushed steel? I'm sure that is not a coincidence. The machine is the same, but when you make it out of an industrial looking material, it's suddenly easier for a man to own the kitchen. This is about appearance, not substance. We all eat food. There's no reason why one gender should be better than the other when it comes to preparing it. It's just we've got ourselves stuck in this weird reality where half the population aren't supposed to do some things. I'm told that the mining industry tries hard to recruit female drivers for their gigantic mining trucks because they drive more carefully and so the phenomenally expensive trucks don't have to be repaired as often. The men are perfectly capable of driving more carefully but culturally, they apparently don't feel able to, don't feel able to. Culture is the obstacle here, not ability or will. When I was a PhD student, I brought Babcha's sewing machine to my house in Cambridge. I cleaned up the iron and the wood, replaced the needles and the spools, oiled the mechanism and teased the machine into action. It wasn't that far from what I spent my days doing as an experimental physicist. I did a particularly mechanical PhD project and I spent a lot of time in the student workshop constructing ex experimental components. Lathes, bandsaws and milling machines were the tools of the experimental trade for me. Once I thought the sewing machine was working again, I bought some fabric and hemmed a tablecloth. The machine was a bit tricky to use. The foot, which is the bit holding down the fabric where the next stitch will go, was slightly loose and I think the age prevented it from tightening properly. But the machine still worked. I cannot pick a single general skill like spatial reasoning, for example, that I needed to renovate that machine that is not also needed to sew a piece of clothing and vice versa. It is all construction. The distinction is just what you've had experience in. At the time, it never occurred to me that the tasks were different. I had a fascinating piece of mechanical equipment. 
and I wanted the challenge of getting it working again and sewing something by pedal power. My mum taught me to sew, but she also taught me to program a computer and to renovate wooden furniture. I've always liked making things, and that includes splicing rope, baking cakes, building hydrophone arrays, making theatre props, knitting hats, and the large-scale construction of an 11-metre 11, 11 buoy to deploy in storms at sea. All it takes is an interest in solving physical problems and a willingness to learn. I've failed far more than I've succeeded, but I don't mind because that's how you learn. Learning is fun. Technology is fun. Culture is a fabulous human invention, at its best when it gives us the framework to cooperate as a society on massive projects. The skeleton of society, the structure holding up our civilization, is made of things like libraries, cities, healthcare, international travel and global trade, and they're all vast cooperative enterprises. But the downside is that sometimes culture holds us back. It's nurture and not nature that is preventing women from welding and men from icing cakes. The tasks are demonstrably very similar in terms of the basic skills needed. I believe very strongly that both men and women should feel able to participate in all the wonderful types of technology that we've created, from programming a Raspberry Pi to making a Raspberry Pi, the one you eat. Let's not restrict anyone. We should encourage everyone to use their creativity and manual skills to construct whatever we need or want and to have all the freedom and fun that that involves. If you look back through history, you'll see that many of the tasks traditionally done by women are technological. We don't have such a large barrier to overcome here. We've got the track record to prove we can do this. We just haven't seen it that way. History is full of examples hidden in plain sight, just like Babcha. Women have been solving technological problems just as long as men have. It's not just the female computers who did the calculations that helped break the Enigma code or the seamstresses that made NASA's first spacesuits. Sewing, knitting, food gathering and preparation, cleaning and running a household also involve technology. This might come across as a bit of a weird idea. If you're not quite with me on this point yet, go and have a look at the definition of technology. Think of the list of technological skills that are generally considered male and ask yourself how many of those are needed to do tasks that are traditionally female. I think you'll find it's all of them. And just for good measure, do the same thing the other way around. Baking a cake suddenly seems awfully similar to grouting tiles. Anyone who can do one can probably do the other. It's time to be honest about what technology is and to give everyone the credit they deserve for working on all sorts of technological problems. To build the future, we need everyone to do their bit. We cannot afford to exclude either half of the population from the tasks needed to make the world a better place. But it's OK, because we don't have to. Both men and women are brilliant at technology. Both men and women are brilliant at technology, and history shows that. So let's all celebrate it, preferably by lifting a 3D printed cup filled with homemade elderberry wine. Cheers.